Welcome back to the Drew Dillman YouTube channel. We are at Unbound Gravel. That's right, Emporia, Kansas. I've done this race one other time, five years ago, 2019. Super hot that year. I made it to mile 175 and then I quit. So, big hopes for today's race. I'm planning to finish and I'm hoping to do well. Um, you can already see there was some nerves at the beginning. There were a couple crashes on the pavement even before we got to the gravel. Um, so you can see that there was a big swerve from the right, right side of the road to the left just there. Uh, I'll give you a rundown on my bike setup. I'm on the state all road carbon setup, full FSA vision cockpit and wheels. I've got the Aero Road Wheels with 45 Getaway Challenge XP tires, as wide as I can go with those. I've got the SRAM 1x48 tooth chainring 1042 Explore cassette. Didn't have any issues with range on my gearing. No flats. I want to start off this video by saying no flat tires for Dizzle. Thank you, Challenge, for hooking me up. These getaway XPs, I want to go on a limb and say they might be one of the best gravel tires out there. I have yet to flat these tires and they roll pretty fast. So right here at the beginning of the race, you can see I'm pretty far back. I wasn't too anxious about getting to the front. It is really strung out. There are a lot of people in front of me. I'm definitely not even in the top 100, but for one, some reason, I just wasn't very gung-ho on wanting to get to the front of this race. I know I have been in races past, but with this one being so long and it going so poorly five years ago that I'm really just thinking I don't want to burn too many matches early on. I really want to play this race smart. Um, and so I'm, I'm really trying to be cognizant of don't go too hard. I don't need to be up there with the leaders. I'm not here to win this race. I'm probably not even here to get a top 20 being realistic um, I think being realistic with your goals is a huge thing that you have to consider going into this race if you think you're gonna win this race and then you don't even finish well then you probably just had unrealistic goals to start with so I think it's really important to kind of keep yourself in check with that now you see Tobjorn Road had crashed I think there was a pile up with him and Carter Anderson he hit the deck multiple times on this day I'm assuming on this road it was kind of rutted out that he must have crossed a rut and or somebody else crossed a rut and bumped into him and they ended up hitting the ground. You can see some people chasing back up after that crash. Uh, but he ended up, even after crashing twice, and one of those crashes was late, like I think within the last five miles of the race, he still finished a solid 11th place. So good on him for, for, for picking himself back up and, and killing it. Um, that's definitely impressive. It is now pee break time, and that's not a bad idea. We're about an hour into this race, I think, so I see somebody else doing that, and I'm going to wait until there's a slight downhill, and I'm going to do the same myself. You're going to see that I'm going to get gapped off a little bit from the group, but that's not too bad because we're not pushing the pace this early in the race anyways, and so if you're going to go pee, now's the time to do it because you can catch back up fairly easily. And for some reason, our buddy Ian Boswell that was on the Bonk Bros podcast last week uh, was chilling at the back of the pack as well. Me and him kind of had this funny back and forth going on throughout the race of like, you know, bouncing over each other. Like he would pass me and I would pass him and he'd be ahead of me for like 20, 40, 50 miles and then I'd pass him and be ahead of him. Eventually, he did get ahead of me. But going into this uh, section about 25 miles into the race, this was the first bumpy, rough part of the course that's going to start to take people out with flat tires. Um, this is going to be where it, it first kind of bunches up and then strings out. You can see Ian had made his way up a little bit uh, ahead of me. 
and that's going to pay dividends because the further you were back going into this section, the more that you would have to chase coming out of this section. So I'm, I'm really far back. Um, like I said, I'm like not even in top 100 right now. And you can just see how slow I'm having to go because the, the, the group is just bunching up so much on these super bumpy downhills. And so then I end up in kind of no man's land after this section, chasing with a couple other people. We do end up catching back up to the leaders at some point, um, but obviously it would have been better just to have stayed in that lead group throughout that entire time and spend less time in the wind, more time protected in that main group. Already seeing one of Mahorich, uh, one of his teammates on the Bahrain Victorious team, one of them already suffering a flat tire. That's, that's a bummer. I'm gonna pass one of these uh, motos and Tim Johnson's gonna be in the back of it and he's actually gonna cheer for me, which is kind of cool. Uh, me and Tim Johnson kind of go back to our cyclocross days. I remember when I was first entering into that elite cyclocross field, he was uh, kind of you know, finishing out his career. So me and him ended up racing against each other a lot um, my first few years of cyclocross in the pro field and his last few years in the pro field. And so, uh, super nice guy. It's cool to see like one of the legends of the sport out there cheering for me on a first name basis. Just super cool. Um, and obviously that's gonna motivate you and get you pumped up to keep riding hard when, uh, when somebody like that is cheering for you. You're gonna see me, all right, we're back up to the lead group. I think we're about 50 miles or so. I'm gonna come up to Ian Boswell. He's gonna say, hey man, I tried, I tried waiting for you. Uh, what took you so long? I thought me and you were gonna uh, attack and go off the front together. And of course he's joking because we're both just like at the very back of this group. Um, but as soon as I catch on, you can see that the group is just like super bunched up. We're barely moving up this little hill. Um, I don't know why that was, I guess because it was kind of loose, um, but obviously not ideal to be this far back. There was a uh, big mud pit right here, so I'm assessing the situation. I can see that people are off their bikes. It's crazy. I'm like, all right, try to cycle across this thing. I'm gonna go over here into the grass. I'm gonna make make some moves. I probably pass like a good, you know, 15, 20 people by doing that, and I stay out of the mud. Um, so I think that was a pretty good move, doing that that side hitch over to the grass. I'm on Adam Roberge's wheel, so. I'm starting to, to be around riders that I'm recognizing. Howard Grotz is just a few spots ahead of us. So I'm like, all right, I, I must be in a decent spot if I'm around these kinds of riders that I'm, I'm recognizing who they are and that they're strong. That's always a good sign when you're around other strong riders. It kind of tells you, okay, I'm not too far back.
Uh, here you can see I'm riding behind Joris Niebenhaus, second place finisher at Cyclocross World Championships. That is one spot behind Vanderpool. Yes, that's right. He was uh, one of my picks to do well at this race, and if you listen to the Monk Rose podcast, Dylan kind of nailed it on this one. He said it's going to be hot, they're going to flat, and they're going to quit, and uh, Joris made a pretty explicit post about how hot he got uh, late in this race, so he kind of nailed it. Uh, I think Joris finished in the 30s, which is not exactly what I had expected. But he had also said when I talked to him during the race that this was just a dream race and he was excited to be there racing. He wasn't exactly there to win, I don't think. Um, but still, probably didn't expect to do like in the 30s either. Another chunky little climb right here where the group is going to bunch up. You're going to see DJ Dylan Johnson on my right. I only really got to talk with him a few times in this race because he spent the majority of his time at the front. As you may know, our boy DJ finished 10th place. By far his career best ever. For a dude that just tries so hard, it's nice to see it finally pay off. And... To be quite honest, it gives me a little bit of hope knowing that somebody that's as normal as I am, you know, I train with him, I talk with him, I hang out with him a lot, to see him get 10th place in a race to this caliber makes me kind of excited for what us small guys might be able to pull off. Um, so that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm super pumped for him. I'm proud of him. Um, I'm excited that, that, I don't know, I hope this just launches him into this new front group of these races it's it's pretty exciting we talked all about that on the bonk rows this week and uh yeah well, hopefully he can he can stay up there now my, my strategy going into this race or at least one of my strategies was to stay with dylan for the entire race which would have been a really good strategy had i pulled it off and theoretically i was thinking that would make sense because he in the lab was only like one or two percent better than me so Theoretically, I was thinking, oh, I should be able to stay with him, but turns out that's not so true. I uh, just wanted to point out, I was going to do these hourly reports, and I just wanted to point out that the first hour wasn't so bad, but the second and the third hour were the two hours where I had my some of my highest normalized power um, pretty early in the race, and that, that was also with me trying to be as aware of my power as possible. So there's that. These, pit, these pits are crazy. They're chaos. They're like a mile long, so I've got it sped up. Uh, homeboys in front of us are going to... Uh, let's just watch this. Yeah. What the yeah, these speed zones are chaos. Um, I, I don't even know why that crash happened. That guy just kind of ran into the other guy. So... Uh, I figure right now would be a good time to go over my fueling strategy. I was being fed by the flow formulas, Nina Machina herself, so thank you to them for hooking me up. 
I started the race uh, with this plan in mind. I was gonna do six concentrated bottles of flow, a couple sleeves of cliff blocks with caffeine, a couple uh, flasks of the gel mix. And then, so I got down most of that. I think the, realistically I, I didn't get about maybe half of those flasks and a couple of the bottles. And then at, towards the end of the race, I just downed two mini Cokes at a stop. Uh, so I, I threw that in there as well. That gives you a total of uh, 1,100 carbs. It's 110 per hour. You can get your flow formulas with code RADDADDIZZLE, 15% off. Hey, it's good stuff. Um, Yes, go get your flow formulas. There was a small section of that Kansas mud that we all hear about. It was only a short little section. It did stick to my tires pretty crazily. Um, you can see it already going flying off though and even just a few moments later you can start to see that rubber tread start to poke its poke its head through again. Um, so luckily there wasn't too much mud on the course for this one. It did make for some cool pictures because you did have some of that mud speckle on your jerseys but in reality uh, there wasn't really that much mud out there. Now I ended up linking up with a good group. There was about four of us for a long time. Um, it was the homeboy in the green there. That's Mark Miles. He's from Kentucky as well. There's me, a couple other guys. I'm not sure what their names are. And then Justin McQuarrie, uh, he's the guy in black. Um, me and him ended up staying together for most of the day. He also does some YouTube. He, in fact, recorded the entire race. I don't know. He's got a, a, a super magical battery that just lasts the whole race, I guess. Um, actually, he just duct tapes a massive battery under his stem but more power to you uh, Justin so but me and him me and Justin ended up riding together for actually most of the day I think he was uh, if you were to put it on paper who I rode with or who I spent the most time with throughout the day it was definitely me and him we were in this group of four or five and then eventually me and him end up kind of just rolling off the front of this group together um, and we stayed together for a really long time we ended up catching a lot of riders uh, me and him were working really well together. Um, Lachlan, in in, uh, in in his post race uh, interview, had even said that like it's good for you to have some compatriots like that. Like he was off the front with Chad Haga, and it's it's hard to ride by yourself for that long of a day. So it's it's super helpful to have somebody that's of like fitness and who you know priorly um, before the race. I don't even know. If priorly as a word so it was good that me and him linked up it was a definitely a good fit and I was grateful to have his his help throughout the day Now we're rolling into what is known as probably the gnarliest part of the course, the Little Egypt part of the course. It's the bumpiest, roughest. There's this really hard climb that's pretty loose. This is where, when I did this race in 2019, I think I flatted once or twice in this section. Um, and so I know that it's rough. We're climbing here. These guys are yelling at me. They yell at me that I've got the best looking kit of everybody. Thank you, guys. And then this guy, obviously a listener of the Bonk Bros, is yelling at me. Hey man, Mohorich is right up the road. If you catch him, you know what that means. That means that by math, you are now the gravel world champion. And I was like, yep, I like I like that math. Um, so getting a little excited, uh, a, gap, a gap Justin a little bit here, not really on purpose, but me and him do link back up. We catch some more riders. Um, I'm definitely getting more and more excited. We're, you know, I think we're beyond the 100 mile point at this point in the race and so I'm thinking man I feel good I go into kind of like this chase mode we we catch a couple more riders here there's Truman Glasgow I've ridden with him in a couple races so we're trying to, we're starting to catch guys that I actually know who these people are and so that's motivating and that's exciting and so um, yeah you can see us roll into this water stop we did all stop and grab some water it was pretty hot 
Um, you know, I talked about all the carbs in my bottles, but I also raced with two hydration packs and those hydration packs just had water in them. And then I refilled a bottle with water at that aid station. So um, I think the biggest mis mistake I made in this race was not having water after the final aid stop. Um, there is our homeboy, the world champ, taking a pee break. I think at that point he had already flatted and was kind of checked out. Uh, We cannot let him catch us. Holy crap. Oh my gosh. I hope my GoPros are not fast enough to get to here. Um, so at this point in the race, I'm starting to take some longer, harder pulls, and uh, my power stays pretty steady. I wanted to point out at hour six and seven, I had some pretty good normalized power here for the hourly report. Um, like I said, I was in chase mode, and so I was taking longer pulls than the other guys, maybe even some stronger pulls than the other guys. Most of the people that we were catching weren't staying with us for that long. I had told Justin we were catching these guys and I was like, man, is this group in our race? And it was a big group of people. And it was it was people that I had recognized. Ian Boswell's in this group. Tobin Ortonblad's in this group. Um, a couple other guys that are obviously strong. I'm like, dude, let's just blow past them. Like, let's just go by them and maybe they won't get on our wheel. And so that's exactly what I do as soon as we catch them. Uh, Justin's on my wheel, Truman's on his wheel. And we try to just blow past these guys hoping like, Maybe we'll just scorch by them and they won't get on our wheels. But unfortunately, that's not what happens. They jump over, get on our wheel, and then we've got a pretty big group of us, maybe 10 um, at, at times, maybe 12 of us. I think maybe Nikki Terpstra's in this group as well. Um, and so I'm feeling pretty good. We catch a couple more guys. I'm just blowing past them. Like I said, I'm in chase mode. So yes, I am taking longer, harder pulls than my other guys in the group, but I'm also thinking like, man, if I'm the strongest one in this group, I should be taking bigger pulls because I want to catch as many people as I can. I want to chase my way up into a top 30 finish. That's what I'm thinking right now. So there were times in the race where I'm like gapping these other guys on the climbs because I'm just feeling good. I'm like, man, if I could just drop all these bums, I'll catch more guys by myself than, than riding with them. Um, and you know, that might not have been a good idea. My strategy going into the race was to pass a bunch of people in the last 50 miles. And it turns out I was, uh, I was one of the idiots that kind of blew up in the last 50 miles. And so, uh, I end up back in this group. Um, we roll through this aid and not long after this aid, I do get through the aid a little quicker than they do. But not long after this aid, me and Nikki Terpstra are gapped off. Uh, we are off the front, but these guys catch back up to us. And I'm with this group now, but I'm, I'm hurting now. I went from very quickly thinking I was the strongest guy in this group 
to very quickly realizing I'm about to barf and I need to back it off a bit. So I'm chilling at the back trying to skip some pulls which seems kind of lame because I was trying to ride away from these guys and now I'm skipping pulls and, and here very shortly you're going to see that I just can't pull through. So I pull the plug, it's about mile 165 where I finally let this group roll away from me. It's a sad, sad moment for me. I'm thinking, man, why did I do that? Why did I burn all those matches? Um, but you know, when you're on the high, you gotta ride the high. And when you're on the low, you just gotta grit it through. So I ride by myself for quite a bit. Uh, I ended up linking up with Brennan Wirtz and another one of the XL riders. And uh, Brennan Wirtz, if you don't know, is a pretty big guy, so he makes for a pretty good draft. And so I jumped on his wheel and rode behind him for a la the last 20 miles, and he didn't flick me through once. And so I wasn't going to contest him in the finish, but then he uh, ended up riding with a friend. And you can see just how bad my power dropped those last two and a half, three hours of the race, and that's also when I had lost the most positions. I had caught up to about 40 I think at one point I was in, uh, within that group, I think we were fighting for about 40th position, um, and I ended up finishing 58th. And so you can see that I had lost quite a few spots um, when I had hit the wall there the last 40 miles of the race. Pretty cool that when I was rolling in, the announcer knew who I was because of my YouTube channel. So he is uh, giving me a shout out and, and telling the crowd to go check out my YouTube channel and that he was excited for the recap. Um, so that was pretty cool. Now, to look at the summary for the day, I finished in about 9 hours and 57 minutes. That's 202 miles, 483 TSS, 262 normalized. Uh, I think I had normalized uh, 274 up until I had cracked the last two and a half, three hours. So 274 normalized for, I think, the first seven and a half hours. It was just that last two and a half hours where the power really dropped and brought down those numbers. Compared to Dylan, who got 10th place in this race, he had said his normalized was 283 for the entire race. And so I was only less than 10 watts off of that for the first seven and a half hours. But you also have to consider that Dylan is also a lot more aero than I am, which I have to admit. So his being only nine watts more than me probably does not equate to the same finish time or anywhere close because he's obviously optimizing a lot more than I am. Definitely something that I want to work on. Now, another interesting thing that I wanted to talk about about this race was a little bit of math. And if you stuck around for this long, kudos to you, but I want to talk about this. Okay, we're going to do some unbound math. Now, I want to compare myself to Lachlan Morton. Uh, I looked up, quick Google search, the EF team budget is $15 million dollars for this year. It said 15 to 17, so I went for the lower one. I looked up how much of a percent of the budget goes towards salaries, and I found that it's 70 to 80%, so we'll take the, the lesser of that. That's 70. 70% 70 of 15 million is 10.5 million. There's 46 riders on the EF website. Lachlan is one of those riders. If they were to split the 10.5 million dollars made up for the salaries between all 46 riders evenly, that gives each rider 230,000 the Project Dizzle Collective, uh, my budget for the year is about $20,000. This does not include the money I make from coaching because I don't think Lachlan coaches. This is the money that I've pulled together for racing specifically. The, double third place. the problem we're trying to solve is that there are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap and then there's us. It's an unfair game. There's, that's a big difference. So you could do some math here. Lachlan finished in nine hours, 11 minutes, 47 seconds. I finished in nine hours, 57 minutes, 35 seconds. So he beat me by 45 minutes and 48 seconds. So if you wanted to go 
that much faster, 2,748 seconds faster. Uh, if you wanted to do the math this way, you're basically paying $76 per second to go that much faster. Another way that you could look at this possibly could be uh, just our total times. And so Lachlan, like I said, went nine hours, 11 minutes. I went nine hours, 57 minutes. So if you break it down by minute, Lachlan was paying $416 per minute and I was being paid $33 per minute. Um, again, I'm not saying anything about Lachlan. I'm not saying anything about, I'm not really just saying anything. All I'm saying is just some interesting math to, to keep in mind. I think maybe the point of me doing this is to make myself feel a little bit better that, hey, he's a professional rider. He is literally on a world tour team. EF is a world tour team. And so finishing 45 minutes down from a world tour rider, hey, maybe I should be happy with that at the end of the day. Of course, this wasn't exactly the result I was going for, but I'm happy with a sub 10. I wanna say thanks to all my sponsors. Couldn't do this without them. Appreciate all of their support. I'll see you guys in the next one.